Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about devices, looking at how we input and output data to other systems, and focus a little bit on disk at the end of the lecture to help lead into the file system lecture next time. So here we can see a basic diagram of a system. We have our CPU, the central processing unit where our code's running and doing all the main computations, and some interface to memory. And memory is also connected to the I.O. bus where all the devices are going to hang off of. The devices will use the I.O. bus to typically DMA regions of memory so they can copy to and from memory to their local buffers. And devices can also appear as regions of memory to the CPU, which is how usually control interfaces are going to be implemented. Let's look at a little bit more realistic view of a PC architecture. So here we've expanded some of the detail to what you might find in a low-end computer or server. You can have one or more CPUs and there's actually several buses hanging off the CPU. There's going to be a, the front side bus which communicates to the north bridge and the north bridge will communicate to memory and also provide high performance buses for AGP for graphics on older systems and PCI, PCI Express on newer systems. Through the PCI bus or alternatively on some newer CPUs or more custom bus, the south bridge exists, which deals with a lot of the lower performance peripherals. This will deal with USB and serial ports and other sort of lower performance peripherals. The IO APIC and the APIC bus in general is dealing with interrupt routing. So when we talked about the interrupt and exception lecture, devices can communicate interrupts through multiple ways. Some of them are through the South Bridge or the PCI bus, and they're sent as messages to the IO APIC or as physical pins to the IO APIC. The IO APIC routes these messages through the interrupt controller bus to the CPUs to trigger interrupts. In most modern PCs, most of the Northbridge and IO APIC functionality is integrated into the CPU itself, into the physical chip. And typically you'll find just two main chips, the CPU with its Northbridge and the Southbridge. So what is memory? Memory is where we store all our values when we're writing our program, but we see that there's not just one kind of memory. In a normal computer, there's going to be several types. The caches are off types of static RAM or SRAM. These memory chips tend to be less dense and there are multiple transistors per bit versus dynamic RAM, which is the typical type of memory for your main memory of your computer, which has a capacitor and a single transistor that allows you to hold charge indicating a zero or one. Over time, the capacitor is going to discharge its value, flipping from a one to a zero, requiring you to periodically refresh and rewrite the previous value. So if you've ever looked at DRAM memory, any kind of DRAM memory, you'll see that there's some reference to a refresh. And this really is that the memory controller has to periodically scan over memory, reading it and rewriting the values to continue keeping the charge of that memory. A third type of memory is VRAM or video RAM. Typically the difference here is just that video memory has multiple ports. You can simultaneously do multiple reads or writes, increasing the throughput for video applications. So let's expand on the idea of an IO bus. So if we look at any computer, there's not a single IO bus. There's actually many IO buses. While the CPU might communicate through the PCI bus or the AGP, the PCI bus usually bridges the processor to graphics cards, to any high performance devices, including storage controllers and other devices that require lots of bandwidth. But most of these devices are buses of themselves. 
a storage controller like the SCSI controller shown on the top right here actually is its own bus. It has its own SCSI bus that allows many devices to be connected to it. An IDE or SATA controller themselves are also buses. They have their own buses where devices hang off of, the individual disks. Other devices like USB are also types of buses. So we can see here for any given device, we might actually traverse multiple buses. You might have your mouse hooked to a USB port and that's going through the USB bus into probably a PCI bus and maybe even a bridge to another PCI bus. Broadly speaking, buses are just interconnects that allow many devices and processors to communicate. Typically the CPU communicates with devices through one of several methods. The most common today is memory map device registers where a certain range of physical addresses are gonna to correspond to particular devices off a PCI bus or other buses and loads and stores or reads and writes to those memory locations are actually triggering IO operations on the device. Typically, these are just control operations to drive the real operations of the device. So a modern storage controller you might set up all the requests you want to do, an array asking for various reads and writes, and then trigger a single write of the address where that, that array is and the length of that array to a special I.O. register, triggering the device to start issuing DMAs and reading in all the data, reading in that array of operations you've requested, and then reading and writing all of the data to memory, to and from whatever the device might be. Device memory is also a case where sometimes devices might expose it, their own memory directly to the system, allowing the processor to directly read and write through the IO bus into the memory of a device. And a third way that we communicate with devices, which is losing popularity, is usually through some kind of special input output instruction. And this is common on x86, and a few other computer architectures, where through these special IO instructions, you can essentially do operations that are like loads and stores, but they go through a separate bus for control to devices. A lot of the legacy x86 devices on your processor still have to emulate these old IO instructions. And in fact, in modern implementations, these IO instructions translate to operations on the PCI bus. Lastly, there's DMA. Typically, we place instructions somewhere in memory and we use one of these memory mapped IO or special IO instructions to poke the device and ask it to perform an operation, pointing it to some region of memory where the op request operations are. The device will issue DMA requests to read and write large amounts of data from memory into some device buffer. So let's look at a really simple device here. And to look at this, we're gonna look at a parallel port. A parallel port is just a simple parallel IO device that allows us to communicate up to eight bits at a time. And historically, this has been used for a lot of printers. A lot of older computers will still have this port on them. And the way that the parallel port works on x86 is that there are three IO registers. They're called ports in x86, port 378 in hex, 379, and 37A. Each of these allow you to control the bits on the physical port itself. And in this case, one nice thing is that most of these bits directly correspond to pins on the port. So we can see here at the top, 378 is the data register. It allows you to read and write eight bits at a time. When you write eight bits, you're making those eight bits available on the port. And you can look at the pinout of the port 
on the bottom right. And you'll see that there are eight data pins, zero through seven, that correspond to pins two through nine on the port. And those correspond to the same bits in the data register. So you can read and write the values on those data pins. There are a bunch of pins for ground and for acknowledging when data has been received for each byte so that one byte at a time can be transferred. So once you are able to read the data, you acknowledge the data, and that's going to allow the other side to know that it can send or receive the next subsequent byte. Let's put this together and look at a simple example driver for how we can send one byte on a parallel port. And here, all we do is we wait until the busy line is set to one. So we keep polling, and this is a common technique in drivers, that will pull constantly asking whether or not this bit is set to one. And while it's zero, we continue waiting and waiting, essentially spinning, just like a lock, waiting for this device to be ready. When the device is ready, we can then output the byte to that port for 378, which will store the eight bits of data that we're trying to transmit. To tell the printer or the device that's on the other side that the byte is available for it, will pulse the strobe line. And what we're doing here, you can see, is that we literally set the bit called STR in port 37A. We then wait a period of time specified by the device and we clear that pin. And that notifies the other device that eight bits of data are available, read those bits, and when that pin is cleared, the device will hopefully have read those data bits out and will start processing it. So here, we're using the in and out instructions in x86 because this we were using an example of an x86 driver. There are other ways that we can do this. The in and out instructions tend to be very slow and they're fairly limited in that they only allow a 16-bit address space. There are only two to the 16 ports available for communicating with devices. So modern devices typically are memory mapped. And how does this look? Well, with memory mapped devices, we can basically achieve the same effect by reading and writing particular addresses in memory that correspond to a device. The OS has to map these physical addresses to virtual addresses and ensure that the values are non-cacheable. In the MIPS architecture, this is usually done through KSEG1, which will have an ident map of physical memory with an uncacheable state. In this example here, I'm showing to three lines of code how we could write to some device memory. So here I'm assuming that the device memory is at C00, C0100. We cast that into a pointer for an int32 for some control register. And there's an important thing that keyword that I'm showing here is the keyword volatile that's in bold. Volatile tells the compiler that reads and writes to this address are actually device memory, and that the compiler cannot do any fancy optimizations around it. It has to ensure that the reads and writes are maintained in the same order. And that no reads can be cached. So the volatile keyword is used to basically prevent certain optimizations in the compiler and let it know that it can't play all these tricks it normally does because we might be communicating with memory that serves a special purpose. The second line uses star device control and writes 80 to it to allow us to write the value 80. And then we use star device control again to read the value to get some status code. And that's how you can use device memory. Just meaning that that memory address though 
needs to point to an actual address of uncacheable memory and the virtual address that maps to a physical address of a device register. Typically, during the startup of a machine, the system firmware is going to facilitate assigning physical addresses at boot to the various devices. So the next problem is that even with memory mapped I.O., interacting with the device tends to be fairly slow. Most modern drivers and modern hardware attempt to minimize the number of times that the CPU directly reads and writes device memory. So this brings us to the idea of DMA or direct memory access. And the goal here is to minimize the number of interactions between the CPU and the device directly. The way that this usually works in most drivers is that we'll create some kind of buffer descriptor list that describes all the buffers and or the operations that the device should do. And we'll write only a couple values, most likely a pointer and the length of this buffer descriptor list to the device itself. The device can then use DMA requests to directly access main memory. It'll read the buffer descriptor list, and then it'll read all the individual operations pointed to by that descriptor list that usually are the bulk of data that we're trying to read and write. So this will be a list of operations, reads and writes, and whatever other metadata that's device specific that'll be issued by the device and not the CPU. This means that the CPU is free to do other work while the device will be busy doing all these reads directly from main memory. It also means that we're alleviating the CPU from these slow device IO operations. So here we have an example of a network interface card. And like many devices, the network interface card is really just translating between two buses. We've got our link interface that communicates to switches and other computers and the bus interface that's communicating to the host computer and to the CPU and a little bit of buffer memory in between that are fairly small, but just enough to buffer small amounts of data and remove some of the latency associated with waiting for DMAs to complete. Typically, the link interface will take care of some of the packaging of the packet, like framing and CRC checks and other things to deal and deal with the transmission and all the link layer operations when communicating to other devices. But the bus interface will focus on taking data from the FIFOs that were received and copying them to main memory in buffers provided to by the operating system's driver and reading out of those buffers that the operating system driver provides and filling them into the FIFO buffers, allowing packets to fully saturate the network link without a lot of overhead or latency. Let's break this down in a little more detail how the DMA operation works. The device driver tells the driver of the device, in this case, a disk controller, it wants to take a buffer at address X and it wants to do some operation to read or write that buffer. The device driver tells the disk controller to transfer some number of bytes from the disk to that buffer at address X. And this is usually going to be issued through input output instructions or memory mapped IO. And it'll take just a few operations to do this. The device at this point, takes over control. The driver is free to return to the OS and wait for a completion notification from the device. So other code, application code, might be running at this point on the CPU, while the disk controller in parallel is gonna issue a DMA transfer. It's going to read and write from main memory, and it's gonna copy that buffer and send 
all the bytes through the DMA controller, reading the data from the disk into that buffer in main memory. The DMA controller transfers all the bytes into the buffer and stores them, decreasing the count until the count's exhausted. And once all of the data has been transferred and it's complete, then the DMA controller usually will trigger an interrupt, notifying the CPU, which in turn, the operating system driver will notify the driver that it's done processing that request. And it can either issue subsequent requests or just issue a notification completion to the application. I'll note here, on a modern system, the DMA controller is essentially integrated into the devices and to the CPU, and they're actually all over the system rather than central, having a centralized DMA controller like you might have in a much older architecture. Most operating systems define a driver architecture which defines the set of entry points between the kernel and the driver for a given device. Usually there's a reset, ioctl to allow user space or users to control the device, interrupt, callback for devices that have interrupts, read and write or strategy to do the bulk of IO, and usually some kind of detection code to help detect the device and verify that this driver is the correct driver for a given device. The big question is, how should the driver synchronize with the card, with the device itself? How do we know when we transmitted data and we need to free up the buffers? How do we know when a disk read is completed? There's multiple ways that this occurs in device drivers. One mechanism is polling. We saw with the parallel port driver earlier that we sit there in a loop polling, checking whether the device is ready or not by looking at the busy flag. We can do similar things for virtually any kind of device. The advantage of this is usually that polling can offer very low latency because we'll wait till the device is ready or completed an operation and immediately process the operation. But this comes with obvious disadvantages. You're using the CPU to basically actively check whether the device is ready. And whether this is done on a timer or done in a hard, busy loop, either of these require us to waste a lot of CPU time in order to detect whether the device is completed an operation. So as we saw with the interrupts lecture, that many devices use interrupts to communicate. Instead of using polling, we'll ask the card to trigger an interrupt. And this is gonna cause the interrupt handler on the CPU to run, which will then determine that it was a device interrupt and scan through what devices could have possibly caused this until it calls that device driver to ask it to come process the request. The easiest mechanism, it solves the problem that we're not wasting lots of CPU. It's not actually always the best. So there are a few things that we'll see the drivers often do to mitigate the problem. And the main problem being that if you have a high enough rate of interrupts, you start wasting all the CPU on interrupts and interrupts are often very expensive. The interrupts have high priority and they're costly because they're basically generating uh, a context switch. We're switching from running in a user application or inside some other part of the kernel and inserting an interrupt. In the worst case, what we could do is that we might actually be spending all our time processing interrupts and never making any progress on actual work. This is known as receive live lock. This is because it was looked at in the case of network cards where IO rates can be incredibly high relative to the CPUs of their time. And usually processing is split into two pieces for these device drivers. Inside of the interrupt handler, packets are received and in queued 
for further processing later in other parts of the OS, right before the OS switches to application or in a dedicated thread, the rest of the network processing will take care, be, be completed, leading to actual TCP streams to devices and allowing reads and writes from application space. This split between having some processing in the interrupt handler and some processing in some other OS context, be it a thread or as part of the cleanup before we return to an application, usually means that we can have enough interrupts to generate enough rece packet receives without actually making any progress. So there are a few ways we can mitigate this. Most cards that can generate very high interrupt rates, network cards, many storage controllers can also do this. They can do something called interrupt coalescing. And what it does is it'll just reduce the number of interrupts and try to cap the number of interrupts with some kind of timer to ensure that we'll only send to this OS a certain number of interrupts per second. A second way that we can do this is that some drivers have an adaptive switching between interrupting and pulling. So when they see a high enough interrupt rate, they'll switch from interrupt mode to polling and then a high priority thread that's processing packets will run every so often, pull on the device, pull all of the packets that are available and then pass them through the networking stack. And this will avoid this problem of receive live lock. So we're gonna focus on disks. One, because we're gonna talk about file systems in the next lecture, and we wanna build an understanding of the underlying devices where we're storing data. And two, because disks still store the bulk of data because they're the most cost-effective way to store data for rapid access. Even though most of you on your computers might have some form of an SSD, whether it's NVMe or a SATA SSD, that doesn't have necessarily all of these performance characteristics, but it still does have some performance characteristics that file systems optimize for. A disk is basically a stack of magnetic platters where your data is gonna be stored as encoded as zeros and ones in the magnetic media. All of the platters are gonna to spin together on a single spindle and they're spinning anywhere from about 3,000 to 5,000 rotations per minute. And there's an arm assembly with a stack of arms that can move over the platter from the inside to the outside and allows reading and writing of the data itself at the head on the tip of those arms. So let's look at this diagram here and we'll see slightly animated that the disc head can move over the platter from in to out or out to in to get to the part of the data that it wants to read while the disk platters, you see the circular part, is spinning rapidly between 3,000 and 15,000 rotations per minute, allowing data at any point on the disk to come under the head. If you look closely at the bottom part of the disk, you'll see that there's multiple platters here and each platter usually is double-sided with a head on either side dedicated. And since there's multiple platters, there's gonna be, for every platter, two heads. And they're all attached on the same arm assembly, a single arm assembly that's moving together. So let's see how data is stored. Each of the platters is divided into a set of concentric tracks, essentially concentric cylinders of a fixed radius. And the head, what it does is when it's sitting at a particular point and, data, and the disc is spinning, it'll read the data that's passing in front of it to figure out where it is physically on the disc and decode the actual data on the disc. A significant amount of the data on the disc is actually error correction codes to be able to correct for read errors. There are a few papers that go into more detail about some of this error correction, but it turns out that over 99% of reads 
are going to have errors as they're read raw off the disk. This is because of all the problems that can happen since it's a physical system. There might be dust, the read head might move slightly, there might be mistakes from the write. All of these things get fixed with the error correction that allow tolerating a lot of errors in the read to re-correct the data to present only correct data to the application. Generally, at a given time, only one read head is gonna be active. So a single head on one of the platters, on one side of the platter, is gonna be reading or writing. So we can see here is a diagram showing us a cross section of the disk. And you can see here, there are three platters. Each one has two heads, one on either side. And we can see the concentric rings that form the tracks. And within each track, and the group of all the tracks are called a cylinder. And within each track, it is made up of a bunch of sectors. In most disks, including modern disks, sectors are either 512 bytes or four kilobytes. Some drives actually allow you to change the sector size slightly, but typically you'll find these two sizes. So how does the positioning system work? How do we know what we're reading and where to read data from? Well, it's pretty complicated and there's a lot of things going into play to do this. And there's usually a fair amount of processing on the disk that's trying to deal with all of these issues and deal with all the noise and error correction that has to happen. So generally the way it works is that the drive will move the head roughly to the specific track and try to keep it there. It's gonna use some kind of feedback and metadata that it's reading from the disk to figure out if it's in the right place and continually try to correct itself when anything goes wrong. A seek, when we try to find a specific block of data that we'd like to read, a specific sector, is gonna consist of several operations. First, a speed up when we accelerate moving the arm to the correct place. A coast, when we keep the arm moving at its max speed, if the seek is long enough, if it's far enough. Imagine moving from the most inner track to the most outer track of a disc. And then a slowdown as we slow down the movement of the arm to try to get it to settle perfectly onto the desired track. Very short seeks, seeks where we're just moving a few sectors back and forth, typically just require the settlement time. This is roughly gonna be about a millisecond. Short seeks up to a few hundred cylinders are going to be dominated by the speed up time, right? The amount of time it takes to speed up the arm until we start slowing down the arm to slow down to the, to the point that we'd like to reach, the sector we'd like to read. When you switch heads, so if you read from one platter to another or one side of a platter to the other, it's basically comparable to a short seek. It might require some kind of head adjustment to find exactly the position of the track. And this settlement time usually is gonna be the dominant factor. And the settlement time usually is longer for writes than it is for reads. There are a few reasons for this. Because when we're reading data, we can usually catch the errors to re realize that we're reading the wrong data or that we've read, it, read the data and it's corrupted. So it's not as bad and the drive can just retry. But for writes, if we were accidentally to write to the wrong place, we might start damaging some other data on the disk that belongs to a, another file or another application or another user. And there's no way to undo this operation once it's happened. So usually for writes, the drive takes longer to settle and find and be sure that it's found the right place. When these kinds of errors happen, they're often known as misdirected writes, and they happen in real, in real systems just because the head might move, there might be a shock to the system, or noise, or vibration causing the head to slightly move around and not write to the correct place on disk. So let's look at sectors, and we'll start to see a little more about the performance now.
remember that the disk interface usually on modern drives presents a linear array of sectors. These are 512 byte or often now four kilobyte blocks that are written atomically and read atomically. The disk maps logical sector numbers to actual physical sectors on the disk, which will include a head number, a track number, and an actual sector number within that track. Zoning usually puts more sectors in longer tracks and track skewing means that the sector for sector zero within a track is actually going to vary from track to track. And this basically is there intentionally to speed up sequential access speeds. It allows it that the head can continually move from track to track as we sequentially read off the disk. The zoning also affects the performance as we'll see that the sequential read performance on the inside of the disk and the outside of the disk aren't necessarily going to be constant. They might actually have different speeds. On modern operating systems and modern drives, the operating system doesn't know how the logical sectors map to actual physical sectors on the disk itself. This isn't true of older operating systems. In older systems, this information was made aware to the operating system, particularly with the way that sectors were addressed. Older systems address things through what are called LBA addresses. Oh no, fix that. While modern systems use linear addressing or LBA addresses, linear block addressing, older systems use CHS, cylinder head sector addressing. So for a given disk, you had some number of cylinders, you had the number of heads that define or twice the number of platters, and you had the number of sectors per cylinder. And this meant that the operating system on more advanced file systems and storage stacks would take into account to create its own logical array of sectors based on how it wanted to optimize performance. Nowadays, as disks have gotten more sophisticated and have more compute power on the drive, all these problems have been abstracted away. One more nice intuitive performance thing we can get out of the sectors is that typically reading several sectors doesn't cost any more than reading one sector. Remember that we may still have to pay the settlement time to do a read or write. So reading one sector or eight sectors really will have no real difference in time. If we start to read large numbers of sectors, then we become limited to the bandwidth of the storage bus. So we'll see that if we're reading hundreds of megabytes, we're bandwidth limited. And when we're reading really small amounts of data, like single sectors, we're really seek limited, depending on the access pattern, how frequent we're seeking on the disk and how far those seeks are, it's gonna affect the performance of the storage. So if we put this and combine this with the previous point that I made, that roughly we see 100 to 200 IOs per second on typical disks, well, we can see that if we do several megabyte operations each time, usually we can avoid the seek overhead and be mostly bandwidth limited. On a modern drive, we could see somewhere around 100 to 200 megabytes a second of bandwidth, and we get 100 to 200 seeks per second, average size seeks. So if we did one megabyte per seek, we'd basically saturate the bus. If we want to basically amortize the cost of the seeks, you'd want the IO size for each operation to be a bit larger than the actual sector, then, uh, okay, fix that, fix that part.
If you'd like to minimize the overhead of the seeks, well then what we'd like to do is make sure that each IO operation is larger than, significantly larger than the IO size that we need to achieve fully saturating the storage bandwidth. So typically on most systems, this is somewhere between four to eight megabytes per operation in order to basically get a few percent overhead in seeks. This isn't always practical as some of your applications might need to do small IOs like databases. No, no, fix that, remove databases. This isn't always practical as some applications simply need to do lots of small IOs all over the disk and others might be able to use sequential patterns that would be much easier to satisfy with large IOs. The disk and the disk controller usually has some kind of bus to interconnect the two. We showed in earlier diagrams IDE and SCSI as two of the common di buses, and these usually provide a lot of functionality. There are a few common things that can happen one is that the controller might facilitate or and or the disk might facilitate caching for reads and for writes to allow us to buffer some data as it's being written to the disk and also command queuing so the disks and the controller can work together to allow many ios to occur in parallel this is a nice feature because what it means is the disk itself can make interesting scheduling decisions about which IOs to run when. That's right, disks, and sometimes even the OS, can make scheduling decisions, just like we did with CPU scheduling. We can apply scheduling policies to the IO. So let's look again at scheduling, but this time from a disk perspective. And we'll see again some similar algorithms that resemble things that we discussed in the scheduling lecture. The first one is the first come first serve policy. Just like CPU scheduling, it's easy to implement. It has good fairness, but we don't necessarily exploit any request locality. So we might pay higher latency for operations and end up having lower throughput. So here I show in this diagram a queue with a bunch of IOs that we've requested. And remember that we're physically moving the disk head along the platter to find all these blocks. So every time we do a, a large move, we're paying roughly the average seek penalty and small moves are paying much less than that. So to put in perspective, remember that the average seek penalty translates to 100 to 200 IOs per second, which usually roughly somewhere around seven to 10 milliseconds per IO versus the head settlement time for really small seeks is gonna be roughly about a millisecond on real disks. So here, if we did the IOs in the order of first come first serve, we see that we're actually making a bunch of sweeps across the disk because the IO, some of them are at the beginning, some of them are in the middle, some are at the end. So we're making all these sweeps and in each of these long lines that we have to go back and forth. So see at the beginning, we go from 53 to 90 to 98, from 98 to 183. Each of these are roughly gonna be an average seek penalty. It means that it costs us a lot of time to actually perform all these IOs in order. So obviously a bunch of algorithms have been devised to provide better scheduling of IOs. An example is the shortest positioning time first, or sometimes referred to as the shortest seek time first. And here, what we're doing is we're exploiting locality to achieve higher throughput and lower latency, but at the cost of some starvation and not always knowing what request will be the faster. So here we're running the same set of IOs. They get loaded in the queue. The disk head starts at the same point, but because we know all the IOs in the system, we can create a schedule of the shortest seek times and minimize the total amount of time it takes us to process all these IOs. 
But here we can see 183 was the second IO in the queue, but now it's the last that's gonna be processed, meaning that it, it's unfairly being penalized. There are other algorithms to improve this. And if you remember, there was something similar to this in CPU scheduling, but we have a version that tries to solve this called a scan algorithm, also known sometimes as the elevator scheduling. And it's kind of like the shortest seek time first scheduling algorithm, but we put in a requirement that seeks must always be in the same direction. And we only switch directions if there's no further requests. This takes advantage of locality and it's gonna help bound the waiting time. The disadvantage is that cylinders in the middle of the disk are often gonna get better service because we're gonna switch back and forth. So they'll usually see better performance. So here, we're using a variant of this where we only sweep in one direction, which is commonly used in Unix systems. And in this algorithm, we start at 53 and we see that we process all of the IOs. It doesn't actually take that much longer than the shortest seek time first, but it provides a little bit better fairness by trying to sort the IOs and only process IOs in a forward direction. Flash storage is abundant today virtually all computers are shipping with some kind of flash, whether it's NVMe or SSDs or other custom solid state memories. The advantage here is that we're storing data by just charges inside of some kind of memory cell. And there's no mechanical seek times to worry about. The cost of seeks basically goes away but there's still a different set of trade-offs and there's some subtle performance things that matter on modern flash systems. And we won't get into all of them today, but one of the interesting things is that there's a limited number of overwrites possible. In any given flash cell, typically depending on the type of cell it is, there's between 10,000 and 100,000 erase cycles. After that, the cell wears down and might not be functioning or able to store your data anymore. In order to make it more useful, since typically when we look at a file system, we'll see that certain blocks are overridden many, many times and are modified more frequently than others, flash drives provide some kind of a flash translation layer. And the goal here is to provide wear leveling. So it actually, has a mapping from logical to physical blocks that looks kind of like virtual memory that translates these logical block numbers that the operating system reads and writes to, to actual physical blocks and constantly moves them around to even out the write cycles issued to all cells within the flash. The FTL can have a serious impact to the performance of flash. In particular, random writes can actually still be expensive because it might require translations to the flash and updating the flash translation layer, which requires flushing those mappings to a flash shell itself. The next thing to consider is that typically there's some kind of limited durability the charge on the cell is wearing out over time. So if you turn off your device and you leave it for a year without running it, you can actually lose data. And this is even more common with cheaper types of flash where the chances that bits decay are much higher. So if you see above, I labeled there's different types of wear out for MLC and SLC. And MLC and SLC are different kinds of flash which store a different number of bits per cell. There's many different kinds of flash and different parameters that defines the type of flash memory you can use. Broadly speaking, there's NAND and NOR flashes. NAND flashes are really common 
for most storage devices, it tends to have higher densities and faster erase and write cycles. And it has more errors internally though, which re usually requires error correction. NOR flashes have much faster reads, especially for small amounts of data. And we'll see these in types of flashes that are used for ROMs or firmware because we can execute code directly out of the NOR flash. But usually these comes with significantly slower erase cycles. The second major parameter is that you'll see SLC or MLC referring to a single level cell or multi-level cell. There are multiple designations usually of MLC cells defi defining how many bits per cell there are. But the big difference here is that a single level cell in each memory cell will only store one bit, a zero or one. In a multi-level cell, will actually encode multiple bits as a voltage level, as a different amount of charge in that cell. It leaves lower margin for error because those different charge levels are so close together that they're more likely to decay from one to the other. The benefit of the MLC is that it's encoding multiple bits. Usually this comes at a slower time to write and to a, a higher chance of data loss. So most cheap flash drives are made of higher number of bit MLC cells, while the most expensive dri drives that usually have longer longevity and faster performance are made of SLC cells. Just like disks, flash devices usually have some kind of block size. And these can be different sizes depending on the type of cell. Part of the storage controller's job is to abstract away some of these details and provide something that looks closer to a disk with a 512 byte or four kilobyte sector size, which might require reading and rewriting data in the flash or updating the FTL to deal with blocks that are split across different pages of flash. So here, I wanted to show off a characterization of two different SLC and MLC cells. We've taken this from this paper, and we can see here that per chip, we've got four gigabytes of data for an SLC cell, and an MLC cell that has two bits per cell has eight gigabytes. It's storing twice the data. Each page is two kilobytes in size, plus some extra metadata we see that the read latencies are comparable, but the write latency is about four times higher for the MLC cell, while the erase latencies are about the same. And given a particular bus, this is gonna to translate to different speeds for read and programming these cells. So reading data out of these cells, depending on the bus speed, will achieve comparable performance while the reprogramming the re erasing and writing usually is going to be about a factor of four different between these two. So when we talk about file systems in the next lecture, we'll get to see some of the techniques that are used to optimize file systems for spinning disks. While we won't get into them in this class, some of these techniques have been reapplied or retargeted toward problems with flash devices. And there's a whole bunch of new file systems around that are optimizing for flash to make better use of the FTL or deal with some of the issues with MLC cells with the slower erase and write cycles.